You're listening to The Digital Deep Dive, where we tackle the newest trends, strategies, and pain points shaping growth across the digital landscape. From Amazon and D2C to international expansion, join our host and e-commerce leaders across multiple industries for in-depth discussions on how to maximize your brands in the digital arena. Now, here's your host, Aaron Conant. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Digital Deep Dive Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Conant, and today um, we've got a, a really interesting topic. It's something that's coming up over and over again across the network, and it's really interesting from the standpoint of we talk a lot about digital marketing, we talk a lot about AI, um, but we don't always tackle um, you know, the, the side of it, which is um, healthcare. And it's interesting because it affects all of us and our family, and yet um, there's been you know, across the industry a little bit uh, you know, and when I'm talking to the traditional brand side, you know, this this side of it that's not quite understood how complicated it's getting, how much it's needed. And so we've got some great friends, partners, supporters of the network over at Global Prairie. Tom Heileman's here. Uh, Tom, you and I have done, I don't know how many webinars together in the healthcare space because, you know, after COVID hit and everything ramped up, it's just so important to everybody. But Tom, I'll kind of kick it over to you. If you want to do a brief intro on yourself and Global Prairie and all that fun stuff, uh, that'd be awesome. And then we'll kind of jump in the conversation, which I want to do is I kind of want to focus it around AI as a whole. Um, but anyways, I'll kick it over to you. Yeah, I'd love to have you jump in. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks for having me on. And yeah, we've been on a, quite a few webinars together. So it's always good to have a conversation. Uh, Tom Heilman, I'm managing partner of the digital practice of Global Prairie, um, formerly Heilman. Almond Group. We merged with Global Prairie earlier this year. Uh, Global Prairie is a top 1% B Corp and 100%, 100% ESOP. So the employees own and uh, mm-hmm. direct this. Our purpose uh, of the organization is to do well and do good for our customers and the planet. And in specifically, we focus, my focus is in healthcare, which hopefully aligns with the health and wellness of all of us there. So um, deep background in the technology, marketing, and um and of course, AI, I'm sure we'll talk about today. So thanks for having me on here and look forward to the conversation. Yeah. I mean, this is going to be super fun because you have a unique, this is why I've always enjoyed our conversation is this unique perspective of, hey, I, not only is it digital marketing, um, but it, you have these added complexities around regulations and HIPAA, which makes, um, it just requires a different level of focus and execution because of the repercussions on the other side. And so um, one of the things that, you know, originally like, hey, maybe this helps out, you know, in, in terms of like AI also could make it a lot more difficult. And so, um, you know, I just kind of want to walk through like, as people st- take a step back and they look at, you know, digital marketing as a whole, and we can focus on healthcare, we focus on whatever you want. Um, but like, what do you see ha- happening with AI in this space, right? Like, how is it yeah. impacting marketers as a whole? And well, yeah, anyways, I'll, I'll kind of pause there and then we'll- just Yeah, there, there's, a, there's a lot going on there. I mean, you think about, and you mentioned HIPAA and recently Office of Civil Rights, OCR and Health and Human Services, HHS have issued guidance on the use of data and what constitutes patient and PHI and that's become more and more restrictive. So I think one of the, be, I guess one general statement, I think AI is going to impact literally everything that we do in the business world and, and everything from a healthcare perspective, both from the clinical perspective of how care is delivered and whether it's radiology and the reading of reading of scans, because there's not enough radiologists around anymore to read all the scans that need to be read. So AI and tools are going to have to be there to the way we market. I think in marketing, with, we'll talk probably talk a little bit about generative um, AI tools, which are kind of the rage, but I think even more interesting to me is the machine learning that you can do for both targeting. So the personas, the people that you want to target and reach at a high definition and the ability to learn and optimize what we're doing on our communication. So I think literally every part of the care journey for a patient is going to be impacted by AI. Well, I mean, do you think that we, like the general population, you know, as we're all consumers of this, right? uh, Do you think they realize what's taking place and the changes and the regulations and how every, like you're talking about the the reading of charts. Does anybody like really realize this? Because I think there's just very few people do. Yeah, I think it's it's pervasive. Like, so a stat I heard, and I don't have the attribution for it, but over 90 or 95% of all of the financial reports for public companies are written by machine now. 
So the, essentially the press releases and the quarterly earnings are almost all written by machine. Uh, and people don't know that because they're very they're very kind of uh, staid, right? So company XYZ reports a profit of X, uh, a Y percent increase over last year's and this quarter's returns, right? So most of those are almost all written. Most news and PR stuff is almost all written by AI today and probably people don't even realize that, right? And I think what folks don't understand is that um, how much of that data is the lifeblood of how, like in healthcare, health systems have more data around about you than anybody else. Maybe the government would be the only one that perhaps has more information than a healthcare organization has for you. So I don't people I don't believe people realize how pervasive it already is um, in our lives. Whether it's automotives that have AI built in them already, even though they may not be self self driving, right? So it's 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 deeply embedded. And I think one of the fundamental understandings of a democracy where we live is to understand like how things how how the world operates, right? And I think that'll be a great awakening for population at large, just in terms of of how all of this data is used, and, and then who has ownership of what data, and then what what it means for me, right? Um, it's it's really it's really an interesting world, but most people I don't believe have a, a really good fundamental understanding of of the level of technological and data integration in our lives uh and, and we've had some pretty in-depth talks just even you know on webinars or whatever you know we've had you know microsoft on um you know a ton of different healthcare systems cleanly clinic but i'm always blown away by how much it is but then i mean my question is then how are how are they using the data? Because there's a couple of things that I want. I want it to be target again, like anything else. I want it to be targeted to me, but I don't want it to be creepy. Right. Yeah. And I want to know that you have the data and that it's repository. It is a repository where it's held and it's safe, but I don't necessarily want that to be on my computer either. <laughs> and then using that. So is there like, are there the, the AI tools that are collecting and organizing it? And then like, how are we, how are they harvesting that data to then do the marketing that they need to do and yet protect, protect it all, including, you know, HIPAA. And then you were saying like OCR, there's some other things that are out there too. Yeah. There's a lot of government guidance around what can, the, the biggest, the newest change is, and now we'll get too technical here for the audience, but um, as OCR and HHS issued guidance and an IP addresses when combined with a personally identifiable PII, personally identifiable information, your name or email or whatever that that constitutes PHI now. So an IP address. So essentially where the IP address I'm connecting to you from um, for this webinar can combine if there was some knowledge of, of information around me from a health perspective becomes PHI. So that's a pretty broad and I would I would argue an overreach by the government. Um, however, uh, that's everyone else is debating it. We all have to comply with it and specifically health systems because they're nonprofits. So the compliance for them is even a, a larger stake. So there's a lot of those that, that going on, Aaron. Um, and so that's going to be the wave, like over, um, personal, the, the the storage and management of data is going to be one of the paramount issues for the next five years. So in terms of today, how they're doing it, the good news is most health systems, they're not using it for any nefarious reasons. They're, they're using it because they want to help provide your care journey, right? So if you're interested in heart disease and you're going on the web uh, the web or a mobile app um they want to personalize your experience so it's something for you right or if you indicate interest in joint replacement knee or hip to be able to present you the information that you need to get you the, the care that you needed that you need so none of it's really particularly nefarious i mean although there's the, the television and movies may make it look that way they're really trying to serve their customers and then measure how effective they are with that so if i had a campaign and you came in, Aaron, can I tie it back to the services that you had? So how effective was my marketing campaign, which any other business in the world would, would do anyway, right? Like how much yeah. <laughs> investment, but it becomes particularly difficult because um, it, it it is patient. I mean, we don't necessarily, folks don't necessarily want to, to share why they're going into um, a urologist or why they're going into uh, a heart or, or to, into a cardiac ward, right? And I, I get that. So- so far, they've done a pretty good job, but the systems are all pretty stovepiped between EMR systems and ERP systems and marketing systems. So they haven't really unified the data. And a lot of folks are pursuing a cloud-based approach for that to kind of put the data into kind of a, a CDP, customer data platform, or 
um, a larger enterprise data warehouse, whatever, them, whatever you want to call it. Um, but they're they're doing that, but they're not very far along just because um, so much of the data is is what we call stovepiped in individual systems. No, but I mean, it literally mimics what's going on with direct to consumer companies today, even large organizations, traditionally retail, you know, that are, are trying to get into the digital space. What am I doing with the data? How personalized, but you know, I, do I have a CDP? Am I going cloud-based? All of that stuff. Yeah. But then you have all these added boxes that are around, Hey, is it legal? Is it compliance or, uh, compliant or not? Um, and you know, what's, what, what's interesting is, um, to see like how it's going to play out because a lot of the, you know, traditional marketing teams that aren't in, you know, banking, which I put really close to healthcare or healthcare, you just dump it into a clean room, it scrubs it, and then you go back out and you can retarget it. But that's not necessarily the case here because of the guidances that are coming out, right? That's yeah, retargeting. I, I, I mean, the fact that you can do this is amazing. That's the, all the restrictions that are out there. Like it's, it's amazing that it can work. It yeah, is. no. And, and you're right. Like clean room concept doesn't really exist perhaps in the research side of healthcare. Um, but in the um, consumer journey side, it doesn't really exist today. It's a very um, banking uh, approach to it. Right. And, and remarketing, remarketing and retargeting are particularly difficult in the world of, of not allowing pixel trackers, which is really what the guidance is about. Um, but pixel tracking is the fundamental tracking for much of for much of the web, right? When you think about retargeting, remarketing, for for instance. So some of those technologies are as they become not allowed, and I think healthcare will lead here, and the other industries will follow. Um, you have to figure out what, how you do it. How else would you do it? And it's with first party data primarily. People building first party data sets is, is where you're going to get the value out. And the good news for health systems is they have a lot of first party data, yeah. uh, so they can they can if, if they can manage that effectively. And I think one of the things that we counsel our clients in healthcare specifically is every brief or campaign brief or creative brief that we do now has a data privacy section in it. How are we going to make sure what data are we going to use? How and how are we going to make sure it's protected? Right. And that way we can prove the compliance. Um, like this is it's already in our planning from the beginning, right? And this is this is what we're doing. Um and that's a that's a big deal. Like so, that that issue is not going away. And if you and I are talking in five years, I can't imagine we're in a world that's less sophisticated and less compliant when it comes to managing data. I just don't see it. I, I think the curve is bending that way, which is welcomed, but it brings challenges. Yeah, I mean, so if we jump into like the AI side, how is that helping out? Because I mean, AI has been the rage, right? It's it replaced the metaverse, yeah. right? Like. Uh, you know, as the rage, but I think it's because, you know, the, the metaverse side was cool and, um, you know, it was, it was something to think about that was fun and cool and exciting, but not necessarily a necessity. Um, but from the AI side, the ability of it to solve problems is it's almost a necessity. And so what well, is, yeah, no, for sure. I mean, you don't have, I mean, so metaverse is still really cool and it's still, I think it's still maybe five years too early. Um, although the pandemic kind of helped it because we were kind of living in a metaverse enforced world for a bit when we didn't have freedom of travel, but it's still pretty early on there. But AI is, is across, I mean, it cuts broadly. And I think a lot of folks, I think mean, now um, are probably viewing AI as primarily generative. So thinking chat GPT or Dolly or Bali or the different tools, right? Mid journey. Uh, but that's the only part of it. Um, this computer vision, which is which is revolutionizing kind of manufacturing and automotive, right? And then there's things like robotics, which will also deeply impact our lives. But they're they're lagging a little, little bit when when it comes to some of this because it was, they're more mechanical, and that was always harder than software because software we can iterate and rapidly or unlimited by only by processing and storage requirements, right? Where in the real world, if you're making robots, it's a lot harder to do. Well, also physics get in the way sometimes. Um, but really the AI machine learning, I think that um, the the deep learning and the ability to make sense of the data and to really provide um, the, the, bi the big issues, we have so much data now, how do we make it meaningful? All this data and no information. So the idea is the data is just the facts, right? And information and insights are kind of what do we learn from them? What do we do with them? 
And I think that's where machine learning in particular has the ability to revolutionize what we do because we can now see trends. We can now do targeting. So we can, we can assess risks of healthcare populations for say breast cancer or different disease conditions, right? And those are good things in a world of limited access where people can't get the appointments as, as soon as they want them. We should prioritize for people who have higher acuity needs, right? Or higher risk because um, simply that's, that's where the lives get saved. Uh, and I think that's where AI can come in, uh, obviously with guardrails and um, testing and understanding of how these things, how these things work and, and checking the biases of them because all AI is biased. I think many people could, are concerned about that, but humans are biased, right? So um, how would we expect our machines not to be biased? Uh, they learn from us, right? They learn from the data that we provide to them, which is built by biased human beings. So we have to spend a lot of time trying to remove that or make it or make that as small as possible uh, in the world. So there's there's a lot there, a lot of, a lot of opportunity. I mean, I think that's uh, if um, we have a lot of challenges as a society and, and AI is a way to help solve some of that in a thoughtful, when, when applied thoughtfully. Yeah, I think it's just a, a kind of a spin on, you know, the technology that's being developed right now, right? You can say, hey, I want to service this this ad, or I want to um, give access to a certain demographic that's more prone, right? To say, hey, you're more likely to develop this, and three people scheduled an appointment, and you're the highest risk, so we need to have you first. It's not that so much different than like all the targeting that's going in in traditional paid media today, where I want to segregate, you know, this portion of the, com- the country because allergies hit first, right? And so serve yeah. ads here with the biggest deep discount and then later up here it's it's the same it's right? similar yeah. right like what well, but I'll, I'll i'll tell you where where so i i think of a, a world of i kind of tend to believe in microsoft's co-pilot is a, a analogy of ai um but it's like as you mentioned things are very similar that's optimization and kind of time of year targeting and location targeting based on allergies obviously in the in the certain areas where they have certain crops or certain types of fungus or whatever it might be right more more prevalent there but i think what's interesting is like so ai would likely optimize optimize uh a prostate cancer uh campaign to men right that you think that'd be a fair outcome if the machines looks at prostate cancer likely men have prostate cancer right not women but in the real world uh women make 70 percent of health decisions so when you're doing marketing and advertising, you we have literally almost 40% of our targeting is women who are caregivers for men, wives, uh, uh, daughters, granddaughters, folks who take care of those folks, right? So in an AI world, this, it would logically intuit that it should just be men who are marketed to for, for prostate cancer. But the reality of it, that's not how societally we do. So so while a machine would do a great job of optimizing within the population for that um, of men, clearly, because they have prostate cancer, the answer is, is not, that's not exactly how human beings work. Right. So that's where I think when we look at the technology, we have to have very, we have to keep our, our, our marketing hats on and our human hats. And if we're going to indicate, if we're going to change human behavior, which is real, all, all marketing is really changing human behavior. Right. Um, so it, it if you look, if you look at the tenets of what we do as marketers, it's all about changing behaviors for our product or service versus your product or service, right? Um, <laughs> and so, um, so the, the, the AI machines can help us, uh, can help us optimize within that, but they don't have a fundamental understanding of how humans operate. So that's where we have to be man and machine, yeah. or, or human and machine, I should say. Oh, totally agree. The, the old. Um analogy around you know everybody loves the self-driving car you know until it hits the the curve with the 35 mile per hour sign that some kids spray painted the three into an eight and then it ends up accelerating <laughs> as you go over the cliff well um, yeah but the argument i'd have there and i have a i have a car that does self-driving um <laughs> is is it a better driver than i as a human I am, right so oh, yeah <laughs> we tend to want flawless machines but I would argue, I think the statistic is there's 2,000 accidents every day or 2,000 individuals in the U.S. get hurt in car accidents. I'm not sure what the number of accidents to individuals is, but let's just say it's close. So is a machine better than that 2,000? 
Um, and then, and then how much better does it have to be? Right. So that's the question. Now it's a little different question for talking about heart surgery, although it probably shouldn't be. Um, so the questions are when, and the number one cause of death, uh, or number one or two, depending on who you ask is, is humans making mistakes in medical care, right? Um, within that. So you look at those things and, um, we have, we have a, humans are horrible at assessing risk, right? Yeah, <laughs> that is one of our flaws of our early upbringing of caves and looking out, uh, looking at, and we're negatively biased because that's how, uh, what's what helped us survive. Cause it's a lot less, um, of a, if you look outside and you don't see a, and you don't see a mountain lion or something going, uh, going to eat you, right. Being wrong on the, not their side, um, and is their side is a lot. It's an asymmetric level of risk, right? So we tend to be biased on for inaction or for protective conservative behaviors, right? So yeah. that doesn't always favor us, right? Where if a machine drives 10 times better than we do, and we can take 2,000 people being hurt down to 200 a day, well, that might be a good thing, right? Um, but we expect perfection often out of our out of our devices, right? And they're no more perfect than the people who built them. Yeah, <laughs> so true. Um, do you see on the like the interaction? I think of the human, the human interaction side. Uh, you know, AI is taking over a ton. Um, you know, think about Amazon, their their virtual assistant that basically jumps on, and walks you through everything. It's all AI. Um, and a lot of you know, there's you know, chat bots and everything else that's popping up on direct consumer side. Do you see the same thing popping up? You know, on the healthcare side as well to help walk people through a journey. I do. I, we see that. I mean, chatbots have been, they really grew during the pandemic as with most industries, right? Because, um, and we have a labor shortage clearly in the clinical staff and the medical care, right? So how are we going to solve these issues without automation? And so a lot of that becomes, um, and once again, I think this is human and computer together, right? So let's think about a call center, right? If we can scrape off 10 or 20% of the, the people who called in and handle them with a chat bot that frees up 10 or 20% more time, our, our call centers then could be doing outreach to people who didn't go to their appointment or missed medications, right? Very proactive things that you could do in a healthcare environment if you could clear that up. So can we take people calling in to find out hours of the locations open, right? Or driving directions or parking or these things that we can, we can handle simply or even simple health risk assessments for allergies or low acuity things, right? And then redirect them to agents or nurses or clinicians in general when needed. We can really save a lot of, we can save a lot of quality of time and let the human beings do what they're really good at, which are more complex tasks and, and serving more complex needs, right? So I think we'll continue to see that. There's risk in it. Like, I mean, if you ever call the uh, health system, it always says if you're having a or a medical emergency call 911. That seems fairly unnecessary to me uh, because like, why wouldn't I just call 911? But we also have com litigation and compliance concerns too, with the tools that are offered. And unfortunately we live in a pretty litigious society. Yeah. I mean, it is interesting though. Again, it, I'm always blown away of how much it mimics the, tra the traditional um, paid media marketing, direct consumer, you know, I just, a lot of what I do is in that space as well. And when you're talking about, Hey, staffing and staffing shortages, and I don't have enough people like these new tools are a necessity at this point in time, you know, maybe it goes back the other way. I don't think it does. I think, you know, they hire people to do different things, but it was, you know, it was one of the, you know, one of the webinars that we we're doing, and I can't remember what health system was, but it was a big one. Um, who was saying like, for that time, they, they were changing marketing to go actually after doctors for a while or nurses, right? I think it was nurse, nursing staff because they didn't need more patients. <laughs> they needed more people to handle the patients they had. Yeah. Uh, we've, we've done that for several health, large health systems that we've actually, and my agency had never actually done a lot of historically five years ago, a lot of recruiting marketing for health systems. Um, but that became a need because the patient, and it, it's the same set of skills, right? Who are we reaching, targeting, messaging, customizing the messaging, and then calls to action, and influencing behaviors. But, but yeah, it's it, labor shortages across, across almost all industries aren't going anywhere. So I think our answer has 
to be how do we streamline processes how do how do we automate which yeah. creates new jobs and new new sets of concerns but we have to um we have to address the shortages of labor that we have to still meet the needs of the, in the healthcare, the patients or in society consumers. Right. Yeah. Are there other like big trends that you see popping up? I'm just, uh, I'm just so interested in this space because I love digital marketing, but also this is something that affects me, my family, everybody around. And yet we never think about it. Right. We, <laughs> we think if we go to Amazon, we type in something, we order it, it ships, it shows up. And I don't always think about my healthcare system that way, but it could, right? Like, hey, this is what I want. This is a schedule. This is the time I want the appointment. And whether it's virtual or in person, it should just work and everything goes. It's the same mindset, but I don't always apply it here. Um, so. Well, it, it's a different market, right? So, I mean, Amazon has entered heavily or is tr attempting to enter heavily into healthcare, right? But they're they're primarily low acuity. So they're thinking of pharmacy services or they're one medical, which is pri some primary and urgent care, right? But specialty care typically isn't in the mix of, of more complex things. Now, there's no reason the health system shouldn't be able to deliver a more Amazon-like experience. It shouldn't be. You should never have to call to get an appointment. Like that seems crazy to me. Uh, having nurses who answer phones to, to help set appointments up. I don't know. That seems like we can do better things with that staff, right? We should be able to online schedule literally everything. Like, I mean, maybe there's some exceptions for very, very sophisticated complex. Maybe you have a patient navigator there supporting that. But yeah, the, the healthcare has been slow to the table and they're going to get their lunch eaten in certain areas. If they don't become that, be, become um, more automated and more of a consumer experience, right? But there's also network issues in terms of your insurance. You can go certain places like in Amazon or wherever you can go, wherever you want to get whatever you want, right? It's not necessarily true in healthcare. So um, it's very complex. And I think, I think the American population doesn't really do, doesn't really understand how to purchase healthcare. Or if you look at our statistics on health, we're not so good at that either, right? So um, I really think healthcare should more, be more about well care um, and changing the paradigm paradigm of, of how we interact as opposed to fixing the sick, um, perhaps helping people, people, keep people from being sick for as long as possible might be a better paradigm for that, but the payment models aren't there. So, so right now I think it's an opportunity for health systems to really redefine what that experience they want to have relationship with their quote patient is. Um, and some progressive ones are being aggressive in the population health perspective and, and that, but I also think it's incumbent, like we all should think about our healthcare a little bit more. And one of our uh, favorite tabs ought to be our health system, right? If we want to maintain the health of our family and ourselves, like we should take that as a serious concern. Unfortunately, I don't think we do. Yeah, I think we're at a time now where we can have that access to the knowledge, right? You go back like 20 years, it's not all online. Right. right. And so if you wanted it, you would have to call, you'd have to make an appointment. You'd have to go try to sift through as opposed to now I go in for my annual well care and I get my blood drawn and everything shows up right on a, on a page I just can go in. I can say, Hey, how did it change year over year? What am I looking at? It makes doctor makes notes, recommendations. I mean, it speeds up the entire process. I don't have to have a follow-up call if nothing's wrong. Um, so I think definitely that the, the way where you look at it now, obviously is drastically different than it was five years ago, but I think the easier access to it could be like one of the tabs we always have open, right. Is our healthcare tab. Are there any reminders, right. Are there any things I need to worry about? Um, yeah, no, it, no, it, it should be that easy. Right. Like, and, and I, and then one of my friends who's a physician, he always told me that medicine should not probably get this wrong, but the, uh, the gentlemen, the people who jump out of um, out of helicopters, para rescue, I think they are. Uh, one of their mottos is: you, sh you need to be an active participant in your own in your own recovery, right? In your own rescue, right? So you don't want to fight the paramedic coming out of the helicopter who's para rescuing, right? You want to help and and be part of it, right? That's how we should be part of it is our healthcare, right? We're not experts like the the doctors and the nurses and the other clinicians are, but we should be able to assist by Hey, exercising regularly, right? Or eating more of the right things or getting our annual blood tests and the different preventative screenings. 
right? But that's the mindset shift that has to happen. We have to be, we, have, we as, as, as citizens and patients need to be more active in our healthcare and take it, take colonoscopies and, and breast exams and all those things that are important for us to be serious, right? Yeah. Are there, um, yeah, and I, I kind of like steer the question away, but are there other things that are cool that are popping up, new things that we didn't get a chance to chat about today that, or do you have any questions for me? Like, I always like to throw that out as well. Um, I've been. Oh, no, I mean, you're talking to everybody. It's re it's really interesting to me. I mean, I, I envy you sometimes, Aaron, and to be able to have all these great conversations in, in different industries. I tend to spend most of my time in healthcare and a little bit in the B2B space. But um, I mean, I think we haven't talked about really the generative. I know I, I kind of deflected that a couple of times. I think that's really going to be cha game changing, specifically in, in a marketing context, because you'll be able to test and do and create content at scale, right? So I think that's, and do, and you do better research. I use, I use chat GPT all the time for re research in areas or specific things that I don't know. And just to give me an outline, and of course I check it versus the attribute, the, uh, the attributions and the sources. So I think those are things, I actually think the biggest issue we face in marketing today is skill and knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, I think that we as humans aren't learning fast enough. And we have tools that can do these great things, but I, I think we're relatively ill-equipped um, at the moment because we haven't been doing enough time. We haven't spent enough time training, and then doing uh, spending enough time um, thinking about how to use these tools. These are complex. Large language models are pretty fascinating, which is the underlying underlying net, um, technology behind Chat GPT and some of the other generative tools. Like I think people should spend a little time and understand how they work and what it means and 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 what what their limitations are. Right. I mean, I I totally agree with you on the the I don't want to say the talent side, just the number of people that are out there. And I think the the pandemic did a couple things. One, it 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 demanded about eightfold the number of open positions in digital of what we had, but that doesn't mean that that eightfold, you know, the, the seven out of eight came up the speed of the one. And since the pandemic happened and everybody's been running so fast and you're just trying to keep your head above water, you're right. They don't, they literally don't have time, you know, to delve, delve into all these new tools, all this new technology. And at the same time, you know, PE money was just, VC money was just flowing in and every other day, new tech was popping up left and right. And I think we're finally at a spot now where um, the PE VC money is tightened up. If you weren't viable, if you couldn't make it by now, you're not getting another round, right? You better be close to series A and close to profitability. And we'll see a weeding out of, you know, everybody getting bombarded nonstop with all this new tech. And they'll start getting hit up by some really, really good tech with a lot of money behind it, a lot of brands signing on board, a lot of organizations testing it out where they can iterate right over and over again. And that's going to give people a little bit, bit of a break and then an area of focus. So instead of having to evaluate 10 tools and pick one, you're going to evaluate two or three and pick one. And it's going to be any of those will work. You're just picking the best one for you. Um, but still, there is a talent gap. There just is. Um, well, and there's going to be, right? Like, yeah. I mean, these new things. I agree. There's a lot of stuff that's out there today. And a lot of it will start getting cut off and yep. um, and things like that. But still, like, we, these are, I mean, some of the stuff is is generational technology, right? Like, I mean, you think about large language models or you think about some of those pieces. Like, those things are sophisticated. Like, and, and what they consider... And, and the concepts that they build from, like th that needs to be understood, right? And I think everyone's so busy doing their day job, they don't always have the time no. to learn, right? And I'm not, I'm not being critical, folks. No, I mean, I feel bad just, for them. I mean, marketing, I do more uh, podcast on marketing and more um, conversations with people at Fortune 100 companies in marketing from the standpoint, it's almost a therapy session at times. Like, like, no, you feel like everybody else does, right? It's just you don't have the time. And digital marketing is probably the most impacted from the pandemic from a career standpoint 
of how much you're demanded to learn. Your budgets went through the roof. You're expected to spend them. And now you're supposed to follow KPIs, KPIs that are only seven or eight years old, right? And you don't even know if they're the best KPIs. It was ROAS for a while and then it's something else. And then you also report into an executive team that doesn't really understand what you're doing. So you're trying to upward educate on something you're learning real time and expected to perform at a high level <laughs> with tools you've never used before. You're just learning. Yeah. And then throw in compliance now. With <laughs> That's data. right. Like, I love these conversations. You're at a, you're at a next level, Tom, like on yeah. top of what everybody else is dealing with. Well, right. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the hard part now too is, so you have the compliance issues, but if, if we're being honest, most of the knowledge there that needs to be learned is by the executives. The folks in marketing already know it. They've been living it forever, but compliance officers, the legal folks, they need to get up to speed and understand what pixel tracking means, uh, right? And how how the web kind of really works. Marketers know that because uh, we've lived in it, right? But the, the executives, whether they're COOs or CFOs or whoever, um, you know, compliance officers, they need to have fun. They can't gloss over technology anymore, right? Yeah. You have to you have to be able to dig in and dig through. We spend a lot of time with the C level folks, just kind of training and educating them on what this means, right? So, for instance, in all this stuff that talked about pixel trackers, everyone's talking about Meta and Meta and Google. Of course, they are because they're huge companies, and we all know them, right? But pixel trackers are used for language transat translation. Whoops. They're used for geolocation for maps. Well, that's another issue. They're used for ge for tickets for issues with the technology. And are, it, they're used for UX tools. They're used for a bunch of things that people don't think about. Everyone's focused on Meta and and Meta and Google because that's what the government does. <laughs> but so like so there's a lot going on here that people don't get to because um I mean, it's a lot, right? And so folks, in, in, in a world of heavy specialization, we also now need to generalize a lot more because there's so many things coming together. And that's tough to be both specializing and generalizing in areas is, is a really hard ask. Uh, any like last thoughts here as we kind of get to the end of this episode? Like this has been so much fun and... <laughs> No, it's great. I, I don't know how you do what you do. I don't. Uh, it's awesome. I'm glad you love it and you're passionate about it. You make my life better. No, it's, <laughs> the healthcare it's so side. Good. Help as many healthcare systems out as you can. No, uh, no, I, I appreciate that. No, I love the conversation. I think, I think. So while we talked about a lot of the negatives and the challenges, I mean, the thing that thing that I think people need to think and where the hope is at, right? Um, is we've never been able to do more than than we do today. So think about what we're doing right now. Um, this is this would be magic 50 years ago. You and I talking on Zoom across time and space, real time to to a large audience who can consume it on the device of their choice at the time of their choice if they choose, right? Like so, it's crazy. And they right? can actually then do a transcript and have ChatGPT kick Summer. out a consolidation if they only want to spend three minutes reading. All right. Give me a hundred words on it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> think about, so think about what, what, how far we've come. And that's why I'm, I'm, I'm tremendously optimistic over the next five to 10 years, because we have all these great tools. We haven't, we've leveraged them at maybe 10%. I don't know what the right percentage is, but very low. I mean, think about Excel or something. It does a bajillion things and you and I probably use 10 of them. Right. So maybe if we trained a little bit, we would use 50 of those things, right? And be a lot better at what we do, right? And I think that's the evolution that I see in front of us. That's the great challenge. And healthcare costs way too much. It's 20 to 24% of the GDP, depending on how you calculate it. Like that's a lot of money in a $17 trillion economy in just the US alone, right? So um, th think about that for a moment. Let's say AI can help us become 10 more efi percent efficient. That seems pretty pretty easy. And at 20% of GDP, it's like it takes us down to 18%. Like that's a big deal, right? And so we can do a lot as a society if we modernize how we work um, as both marketers and, and just in general in the business world or just as as, as consumers and citizens, right? So, um, I mean, our future is, is extremely bright. Uh, the ability and the, our ability is leveraged on our ability to gain this knowledge. So um, we can now learn literally anything we need to learn on the internet. Some of it true, some of it not. Right. So we still have to be smart enough to understand those differences. But 
Um, it's an incredibly optimistic time. I mean, when when is a better time to be alive than right now if you're a marketer? Like I can't imagine. Yeah, you've got all the tools. No, I love it. Um, and I, I love your optimism. <laughs> it's a great way to end a podcast. Could have gone two directions, right? <laughs> the doom oh. and glue or the robots are going to take over. Or hey, this is really an amazing time because it is. Uh, and the people are worried about the robots. I have zero worry about the robots right now because robots aren't very efficient. So yeah. Uh, <laughs> Once they start delivering us pizza and things like that, and they can, they can be a little more mobile. Then we'll have to think a little bit more, but not, not quite yet. Not quite Roomba, yet. Roombas, Roombas aren't taking over yet. No. <laughs> awesome, my friend. Old time. Always a pleasure. Uh, and uh, with that, we're gonna wrap up this episode of the Digital Deep Dive. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Aaron.